routine pickups of backpacks filled with drugs were weekly occurrences for kids like us. We learned to pay attention to detail with pocket scales and how to fill our empty bellies with dirty money generated by street sales. Noah, got you. Except this night, things didn't quite happen as they had happened during past interactions. He robbed me for $3,000 and every ounce of pride that I had left. The handle on my 357 marinated in palm sweat as I contemplated the decision that would forever alter my life's existence. When I was younger, I was a lot happier, but I can never compare that to the way I feel now. And even now, I think back to the days to where I never want to be a kid again. And a lot of people say that, like, oh, I wish I was a kid again, because you had no responsibility. I, I could not honestly say that. And I remember just as a, as a child feeling really powerless, and I had no, no control over anything that was going on around me. A lot of my memories from my, my younger years were my life being really dysfunctional and a lot of the time my parents fighting and just life being a little out of control and crazy. And I also remember my dad and my mom, no matter how broke we were, no matter what was going on, them working their asses off to make sure that we had a Christmas every year. And I remember that perseverance and that grit from both of them to make sure that they would provide for us. That was. How do you say it? He was an easy kid to like. Always had a sense of humor, great imagination. He was fascinated with, we called him his guys. He'd play with G.I. Joes and Army guys, and he would tell his older brother, no, that's not what he says. And <laughs> so James would rephrase it so Noah was happy. Me and my brother would go out there, and no matter what was going on in the house, we could lose ourselves in the weeds. And we'd build these cool little forests and everything. But the thing was, like, we just didn't mow our lawn. Like, we thought it was a forest, right? But this shit was just an overgrown lawn. But we loved it. Noah always had a, a mischievous side to him, so to speak. He had a lot of energy. He got in trouble because he drew on my wall on my side of the bed. And I'm like, Noah, why'd you do that? And he's like, Dad's a guy to protect you, Mom. He always had a way of making me laugh, so he'd get himself out of trouble. I think we always had a special connection. I think my favorite memory of Noah would be him taking a black marker and drawing stripes on himself because he wanted to be a tiger. I remember when I was like nine years old and that's when I moved down to Southeast Portland and everything. And that's where I felt like I really started getting into more trouble. And I started getting in fights more regularly at school. And I really started to take that, that downhill turn, you know, even at that young age. And I just look back on how I started building my identity to where it was cool that I got referrals and other people kind of looked up to that in a way, you know? And I just started gravitating towards that. Darlene talking with his counselors, she decided that he should go to Lentz Education Center, which was a mistake. What I would call it now is it was trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole. He just didn't fit the mold of public education necessarily. But it wasn't my decision, it was his mom's decision. And even she will admit it. If I knew then what I know now, he would never ever gone there. I didn't realize that a lot of gang members were going there and Noah was kind of fascinated by that kind of lifestyle. That was kind of the beginning of everything going downhill the minute he went into alternative school. I would get phone calls from the school telling me this is what Noah did. Noah, Noah got caught smoking pot. Noah is picking on 
Elizabeth. Uh, Noah ran off, uh, just got mad and took off. A lot of gang activity there, a lot of troubled kids. And Noah kind of just went that way. So when I was 12 years old, that's when I started selling drugs. And I was having meth addicts buying me 40 ounces. And I was drinking 40s, falling off my bike, riding home from the park. And I think for a lot of teenagers, once you hit that age, you want to become your own self. And I just started gravitating away from my family and didn't really feel like I, I fit with them. I know things at the house were still crazy and I ended up finding a group of people who were kind of like me. Me and Noah, when we were young, we'd always tell people we were cousins. Every one of us was from a broken home. Everybody came from something. None of us had nothing. We didn't really have families like that. And so that's why we, we became that family. That's why it was family kings. And you saw I say that family first. You were king second, family first. By the time I was 13, I got jumped into the gang. And those were the kind of people I felt like I fit in with. And this was a group of people who came from similar family backgrounds. And together we made up our own family and we took care of each other and we watched out for each other. I ended up being a part of, of the gang that was in my neighborhood and around Southeast Portland. Yeah, this is 145th Street, this is G Block. We used to be out here posted every day. When we get the group together, everybody used to live out here. That's why this neighborhood got the name G Block. It was a name that the cops, the gang enforcement gave to this neighborhood. They called it G Block because it was the gangster's block. It's, and that's what it was. It didn't matter what time of day you came out here, you walked these streets, you would see thugs <laughs> posted up. Okay, so yeah, this is where we used to live. We all lived together for a while. Kept drugs in the wall. <laughs> we have our, everybody had their pistol under their pillow. When me and Noah would get up in the morning, we would start this crazy day. We would come out here, and we'd come right out here to this stop sign. we hang out right here. we go, we go right down the store corner, get a couple 40s, drink right here, and burn a red rag. <laughs> and uh, drop a clip. That was, that was our morning, and then we go start our day. Yep, and it was wild. Like, this is what people did to connect. It's almost like going out with your friends to go eat some food. This is what people did. And I think a lot of it comes from drowning out of reality. And there was something strangely empowering about that. It's to where you were no longer running from all the things that, that you walked a little faster when you're walking home at night, you know? You weren't scared of that stuff anymore. And it brought a sense of security to me. And I remember walking out to the street sign with a blue bandana in my back pocket, feeling so proud and feeling like I was a part of something so much bigger than me. So he used to come and read with you. He'd sit in your room and read. Yeah, I agree with that. He'd sit in a chair for long periods of time, but to do other academic work was really challenging for him. He was so like busy and, and uh, just the need for movement and the art type of thing was really difficult for him to sustain concentration and it just, it just, he didn't have a frame of reference in his head to hang that information on. I don't know how to describe it. My opinion of school when I was a teenager was that it was completely irrelevant to what was going on around me and my environment and in my community. And that the things that were going to get me ahead were already in front of me, which was selling drugs, which was doing the things I was doing because that's where I found acceptance. I mean, that's how I was taking care of myself. So I saw that more that the streets was my teacher. And you gotta also look at the examples, right? It's like my family wasn't doing that. So no one was like, oh, if you go to college, you have success and you have this and you have that. Like that just wasn't the message that we were getting in that time. There's a lot with Noah that I would have done different. There is no doubt about that. I would have done a lot different with Noah. I see I did the same thing that my dad did, which was spend a lot of hours working and not enough time with him. During his adolescence, him and his dad fought a lot. You know, one time he was drunk and he asked me how I could marry someone like that, um, which really kind of started my whole process of self-reflection of, you know, what was going on in that. Noah was a hard kid to discipline. Hard for his mom, hard for me. I, I was the tough one when it comes to discipline. You know, I put him in corners and I was the heavy. The easiest way to say it. 
Noah, what did Noah call it? He said, you're the, you're the one that keeps everybody calm. So, you know, when I left, it kind of made chaos. So. Just it all happened really quick, you know? I remember me and Noah came back from this, this uh, we, went, we went to the beach and we had this great time, you know, and we were just so happy and just like, you know, we were like, you know, life was good at, the, at that moment in time. And then as soon as we got here, we just opened that door and I swear to God, it was just like, oh, as soon as we came, as soon as I drove back through this neighborhood, you could just feel it and it was just like, oh, we live here. You know, and like, this is where we have to be. We gotta come back to this. As soon as we opened that door, walking, we opened the door, it was just chaos. It was just there. So the night that I got arrested, I had ended up getting robbed that night. And I was really desperate because I was, I had a tons of customers calling my phone and everything. And money was so tight at this point and we were losing our house and life in general was just out of control my mom had left it was a rough time period for our family number one his mom and i split up and noah took that hard and i seen a lot of change in noah for the worst at that point me falling deeper into the streets drinking every day smoking every day even more and just losing my mind losing my mind and I ended up calling up this guy who I didn't ever really go through. I've been to his house before. And he picked me up and took me to this spot and told me, all right, give me the money. I'm going to go inside and you meet me up at the front door. I was like, all right, cool. So I gave him over $3,000 and he started walking towards the back door. I started walking towards the front door. I go to open the front door. The front door is locked. I walked back to the car and I noticed that it's gone. And he had, he had taken off of my money. And I lost it. And I pulled open my phone. The first person I called was Guy and asked him if he could pick me up. And he picked me up at the max stop. So I got a 40 of Old English. And then I started killing that on my way in the car. So we get back to the neighborhood. I have him drop me off down the street from the house. Me and Guy are walking back to the house. And Guy's talking to me, trying to calm me down and everything, to ask me what we're going to do and all that. I knew before he said anything that it was, it was over, everything. I could just see it in his eyes. He just had that look, it was like empty. My brain was just so focused, I just wanted my gun. I just wanted to feel some control. Like I just felt like everything had been taken from me. It was like, this is devastating. And we get back to the house and everything and I grab my, my 357 from under my bed. And at that point, I decided that I didn't want anybody coming with me into this whole thing, and that this was something that I was gonna handle myself. I didn't want to pull anybody into the situation because it was my own problem. And Noah walks up, gives me a hug, tells me he loves me, and that wasn't Noah. Noah didn't tell you he loved you. And you know, I remember looking back at Noah thinking, something up, but I didn't put two and two together. I put the 40 bottle on the mantle above the fireplace and I walked out of the door and I had a guy right behind me and I asked Guy, we hopped into his old Buick and we started driving to this place. I told him, like, he's not coming with me. And Guy, Guy starts, like, tears coming down his face and he's like, fool, let me fucking ride with you. Like, let me ride with you. And I looked at him, I was like, nah, nah, you're not coming with me. And he was like, fool, let me fucking ride with you, bro. We do everything together, let me ride with you, dog. And I just told him, like, nah, bro, like, you ain't coming with me. And he left the car with the 357 in his in his waistline. And as soon as he left that car, I just I was just I didn't know what to do. I was just like I didn't I wanted to just run out and I was just prayed that he didn't do it. I was just praying that he wouldn't do it, that he would wait. And I ended up finding his house, and I started walking up into the driveway. And at this moment, I knew that this was the last point to which I could turn back. And I felt like I had been given multiple chances that night, and I was 100% committed. And I flipped open the window and I hopped in. I drew down on him and I told him, where the fuck's my money at? He lunged in and he tackled me. He was holding on and I just started pistol whipping him over and over and over again. <laughs> to the point there was just so much blood. There was so much blood. He ended up looking up at me and like made this crazy noise and he started crawling off to his bed. And he reached for something under his bed and he ended up pulling out a shotgun and I shut the door behind me. He yelled out, now what, motherfucker? And I was running down the stairs when he said that. Like, I had just given this everything I had. And like, 
He's like, this person was saying, now what? And it was just my pride was so damaged. I was so damaged at this point. I just ran back up the stairs and fired some shots off into the door. I ran down the stairs, ran through the door, and just started running full sprint down the street with my gun in my hand, ears ringing from the gunshots. That night, I went back to the neighborhood and started drinking again. Started snorting Percocets and drinking 40s in people's houses who we used to go to every night. When they came looking for Noah, we didn't even know what was going on. James, his older brother, walked out the door. And next thing I know, I'm hearing shots being fired. And I hear, you fuckers killed my dog, right? They kept on yelling over their loudspeaker, Noah Schultz, come out, you know. They arrested me, they arrested James, they put him in handcuffs and set him right across the street, right in view of Tito's body. Tito was James's dog for six hours. And I found out he was, you know, over here down the street at, um, at J-Dog's house. Finally got over there and I remember just being able to see him, we sat there and drank a beer with him for, you know, the last, last bit of time that he had and that was, it was just a really emotional a really emotional time you know we, we all knew we all knew what was gonna happen I ended up turning myself in walked up to the barricade and I called my brother and told him I was like hide some of my stuff you know and I remember being so scared because I had guns in the house my dad had been to prison he had a record and if you've been to prison you can't have guns around you and I was more concerned that my dad was gonna get in trouble for that than anything so I ended up turning myself in that night and they interrogated me and then they dropped me off at the, the juvenile detention center. There's a lot of bitterness there. There's still a lot of bitterness there. Things were handled all wrong. A lot of nights of crying myself to sleep because that's not the life you want for your son. More than anything, I was done. I was done running. I was done with everything around me. Maybe I seen it as my way out. My first day in the facility was pretty awful. I remember the lady bringing me some food to my cell, and I was so hungover that day, and I couldn't eat the food. My stomach would not accept the food, and it was like that for a couple months that I was in this facility. And I felt like my body was detoxing from just all the, the shit that I put into it. And I started getting depressed. I started contemplating suicide, as crazy as that may sound. He was pretty scared, didn't know what was going to happen, but, you know, it was just a waiting game at that time. Nobody really knew exactly what the charges were going to be. When they were throwing down numbers of, you know, nine years, seven years, five years, I'm going to be old. <laughs> I mean, it's a hard process of just waiting and waiting and waiting and your life's in people you don't know's hands. I came down with a list of charges that made no sense to me. I had never heard of Measure 11. And all of a sudden I'm looking at what they're telling me is seven and a half years to 10 years to whatever they want to give me if I take it to trial. So I felt like my life was over. My role as a director of this agency is to follow the law. So now I can have my own opinions. What I would say about Measure 11, I would say that generally initiatives and measures and laws respond to the environment. I think when Measure 11 was passed, we were facing with an environment where youth were um, perceived as threats. You know, what did they used to call them? Um, you know, super predators. You, know, you might remember that. Our next step in the fight against crime is to take on gangs the way we once took on the mob. I'm directing the FBI and other investigative agencies to target gangs that involve juveniles in violent crime and to seek authority to prosecute as adults Teenagers who maim and kill like adults. You know, youth violence was up, violence as a whole was up. And uh, there was a uh, widespread belief that uh, the answer to that problem uh, was to treat young people more like adults in the criminal justice system. And the wave hit Oregon in 1994 when voters passed mandatory minimum sentences uh, for adults and certain juveniles aged uh, 15, 16, 17 years old. To 
be honest, I I had no idea what what my future was going to be at that point. At 17, I I couldn't imagine who I'd be today. It was just so foreign and just so outlandish to think of 24. Waiting for that sentence is so stressful. It is so stressful. And I was just over. I was over fighting. I was just giving my sentence and let me move on. And I remember sitting in my cell and they called me over the intercom. Not that they were calling me for a shower. They told me I had a phone call. So I went up and I got on the phone and everything and it was my attorney. And my attorney told me in this defeated voice, Noah, I just got off the phone with the DA. I told him what had went on and the DA said there were shots fired. Why would I want to give this kid anything under 90 months? And I remember walking up the stairs to talk with one of my best friends, Stephen Fowler. And he was sitting in his cell and he was reading a comic book and I opened his door, knocked on his door, and we're not supposed to go in each other's cells and everything, but I didn't care. And I was like, Steph, bro, hey, they told me that I was getting 90 months. And he was getting the same. And he looks up so casually from his comic book and he was like, fuck it, me too. He's like, you know what, bro? He's like, we'll do this thing together. And he's like, we'll go to McLaren. He was just like talking, like calming me down and everything. I remember that, that day will always be ingrained in my mind. At McLaren, I went as often as I could. Usually it was every weekend. Um, um, I mean, there'd be like, sometimes the kids had soccer games or something and I couldn't make it because it was an out of town game or something. But we went, usually the kids and I went every weekend. It's not just the child that goes through, it's the whole entire family too. Their brothers, their sisters, their mom, their dad, the people really close to them. They also are, so to speak, serving a sentence. Not physically, but emotionally. I don't think it was fair. I think that guy who, like, like that got him there, I think that guy should have got some time, too, because of what he did. But, like, yeah, I don't think Noah should have got that long of a sentence. The hardest times are birthdays, holidays, family events, like when his uncle passed away and he couldn't be there for the funeral. You know, um, weddings, when all the family's there and he's not there. It's, you know, it's kind of sad not to have him be a part of that memory. If you look at the history of many of our kids, they have experienced trauma in the past. They have experienced significant challenges and suffering in the past. And in the process, they have created their own victims. So, you know, our task then becomes to make sure that the brain development process occurs in a healthy way, and at the same time, the concept of accountability is present. A lot of guys, they just have been told, I think, so many times in life that they're not good enough. And by the time they get to McLaren, their self-image is so damaged that now you're really having to start brick by brick and building that up. Ending up in prison was a good thing for me at that time. And taking a step back from the whole gang thing, mainly because my life was so out of control that this oddly added some stability to my life. At some point along the way, he must have made a decision that he was gonna push through his fears. You can do it, but it's different when you got somebody he was always very present. You could just see him light up when he learned something. And then it was like he would sort of flex his muscle, so to speak. Once he got removed out of the neighborhood and away from all of those influences, our whole relationship changed. And I told him, I just said, they can lock your body up, but don't lock your mind up. They have programs, take advantage of everything, and knowledge is power. So gain as much knowledge as you can and do everything you can to make yourself better. One of the things that mainly led up to my change was my own hunger for a new identity, even though I didn't know what that looked like. So it was like reaching in the dark for something. You know it was there, but you know exactly what it was. But when you have nothing to lose, you can only go up. An inmate talk. 
Another thing was being given the opportunities to discover who I was as an individual, who I was as a new person. And that was a lot of that was through the whole partnership and being given classes to attend, education that I actually wanted to take advantage of and have, have an environment that, that promoted growth. This program was developed by youth who wanted to do something with their time outside of school and work. So Noah comes as everybody, young, gangly. He, he reminded me why I love teaching high school. I loved the oddball kid. I loved the kid had too much energy. So Kathleen was a door opener for a lot of us. She almost took on that, that motherly role that a lot of us needed, especially in a facility like that, to where she had a genuine interest in our growth and seeing us become better people and seeing us become leaders and seeing us create community in that kind of environment and letting us know that that was our community and that even though we were incarcerated, we could promote change and we could change our environment. Do you remember we did a writing group and one of the exercises we did, I said, we're just gonna come out here and we're gonna walk and we're not gonna talk to each other, but you're gonna try and experience yeah, the senses. Yeah. Do you remember yes. doing that? Yeah, I do remember that. When we came back and we wrote about it, I don't remember what you wrote, but your enthusiasm for the sensory experience was just, I would say, really rewarding to see <laughs> that you responded. Yeah. But I think that's just in your nature to mm -hmm. take an experience, fully jump into it, <laughs> not knowing what the outcome will be. I'll go on a walk with this like crazy yeah. lady. and. <laughs> Mainly, I'm just preparing myself to see how I'm going to make an impact on this world. I tell people I'm going to change the world. And I'll say that in a youthful way, like, oh, I'm going to change the world. I mean that when I say that. And I'm just preparing myself to make the most positive impact possible. The title of this poem is Spring to Life. <clears throat> the plants that occupy the rainforest floor are in constant competition for sunlight. They survive. Of the bits that fall through the canopy. The conditions are fixed, so the plants are used to it. But every once in a while, a hole opens up from a broken branch or fallen tree, and the seeds that lie dormant spring to life. They reach for the canopy because their lives depend on it. The hearts that occupy the U.S. prison system are in constant competition for love. They survive off the bits they hear through phone calls and words they read in letters. The conditions are fixed, so the hearts are used to it. But every once in a while, a hole opens up from destiny or pure luck and the hearts that lie dormant spring to life. They reach for intimate connection because their lives depend on it. Have you ever seen a rose grow from concrete? Have you ever seen love grow from a jail cell? Both are beautiful. Both strive for survival. Reaching their branches, branches to the sky in an attempt to touch what gives them life. You know, some people is evolving every day. You are who you hang around, you know, and the people that I looked up to, I'm going to ultimately become. So, I'm like, okay, yeah, this guy obviously is doing something right, you know? When you hear his dreams, you, you like to say, like, you're crazy. And that's the kind of people that we like. You know, I want to hear that you're crazy. And I told him that I wanted to change the foster care system. That was really hard for me. And through tears, I was just telling him. He said that he was going to get me set up with some people. I've already talked to legislators, getting ready to talk to senators. I mean, it's happening. I think one of the best things people can do on top of funding programs like the programs that Transform Noah is to just simply go in and volunteer and connect with an inmate, whether it's volunteering for a program specifically, whether it's just meeting one-on-one -on -one and hearing their story. Just your presence is powerful as a volunteer and can be the catalyst for huge transformation that you may not even realize is possible. So I want you to start by looking at the books on the table and like grabbing one that speaks to you. So look at the cover, look at the title, maybe it's the author's name, but grab a book that calls your name. You say pendejo, I say tu padre. Te mandan saludos. Who? Mis canicas peludos. Peroneta, I miss the short-lived days kicking in with my childhood friends when it was 90 degrees. Simpler days, those were shooting pigeons with pellet guns blowing up fireworks. As I blew the ashes from the wooden stick I burned, filled with joy and innocence as the next stick I burned was filled with regret. If you're over there and you're working on that when you write it down, oh, is that the same yeah. category? Right. Identity? Yeah. 
There is an old saying my grandmother used to say. She used to talk about people's get up and go. Noah has already gotten up, gone, he's out the door and he's done it. And any kid can do that, but they've got to start with just a little bit of hope and start feeling their own muscle. And I think that's a great starting point for anybody. What are we all struggling with? We are struggling with finding time. And all that's available when you're incarcerated is time. So how you choose to deal with that time can significantly impact the future. You know, I started building that self-efficacy that I could do things and I was able to accomplish things I, I had previously thought I couldn't do. We didn't do anything for Noah. Everything that Noah accomplished, he did for himself. Everything that's available to Noah is available to all of our kids in our facilities. He took advantage of them. Restorative justice, nonviolent communication, native beating, I make jewelry, yoga, Buddhist group, meditation, anything that was offered, I was there. He's basically found that internal power. People didn't think he'd ever do it. I mean, this is my kid that I thought would never finish high school. He's not only finished high school, but he's got college degrees. With Stefan, we started thinking about poetry for the people in this detention facility. Speaking at TEDx Salem and getting a standing ovation from the crowd. Thank you. And seeing all of the hours of work while I was in McLaren come to fruition. Like, I can do that, you know? I can speak in front of a thousand people and be confident, all while having that secret label of inmate behind me. I knew that whatever he set his mind to, he would be able to accomplish. He's just that kind of person. I was just trying to get it from a negative to a positive. Noah epitomizes what we're trying to achieve, and we have dozens of guys now who are on that kind of path. When you look at Noah's accolades and accomplishments, he's the perfect example of why we should come in here and give these kind of programs to these facilities and support the missions and visions of the youth in these facilities, because there's a lot of good that they can do. All right, sir, y'all keep it up, man. So I'm really excited to see what kind of man Noah turns out to be. I'm happy I've met him, I'm happy I'm learning from him. I consider him one of my mentors, definitely. Noah is a great guy, and uh, he changed my life. We decided, as a society, that if you do something wrong, you're going to be penalized. And these guys are fulfilling that side of the contract. Now, when it's time for them to come back to their communities, people can't go, oh no, I changed my mind, I don't want them back. You have to be part of the social contract through the whole the whole gamut. I'm coming to the end of my seven and a half year sentence. And along that journey, I've learned some things I felt worthy of passing down to you all. If I could talk to a young person who is facing a large amount of time, the thing that I would tell them is no matter what your circumstance, you can always grow inside. And your personal change and your personal growth is something that nobody can ever take from you. And to be a light in whatever circumstance you're in. Noah has realized a lot of things since he's been in there. He's realized that bad company corrupts good morals. He could have been angry, he could have been mad at the world, and instead of that, he accepted responsibility for what he did and turned it around to help others and help himself become a better person. Something has guided us along this path. We stayed out of the grip of death for a reason. We stayed out of the grips of death to bring life. To be honest, it was a little overwhelming at first. You have a lot of people who are happy to see you come home and are showing you a lot of love for you being home. And it's, it's really hard to process all of it. Once again, just pretend that everything was cool, even though inside there were some things that it was, it was really emotional for me. Oh, ah! Be out, baby! Woo! The 
hardest part about all of that was leaving the people who I become so close with behind that I had people around me every day, right? I'm going to a, a room that's it's me all alone. I, the world felt lonely a little bit out here. I was calling back to the facility and talking to my, my friends, like talk, calling Stefan and everything and checking in with him all the time. I'm excited to have him back home. I'm excited to have him back in the lives of his siblings. Finally be a brother again. Right here, right now. Some people are gonna wanna see him fall. So I worry about those things. I mean, things moms worry about. <laughs> Society will always have the judgmental side saying once a con, always a con. And I did seven and a half too, right? That's where no one I have. He didn't call me. <sighs> I hate to say that like that. It's two totally different worlds being in there and being out here. Man, I just want people to acknowledge this story, the story of these people, so it's not so numbers focused. We are not numbers. And everybody has a story, and everybody has something that got them to a certain point in their lives. And it's important that we look at that. And I want to change the way we communicate within this system. Everybody's success is personal. If for one kid who just gets out, gets a job, gets married, and has a family, and that's success for them, then they have easily achieved as much as Noah. Noah, as well as many of the other, they're like my own sons. And I tell them, you know, and somebody like Noah, you'd be proud to have as a son. Got the energy and the drive to succeed at anything he puts his mind to. Even looking at who I've become today, I look back for those small traits of who I was when I was a teenager, who I was when I was a kid, and they're here with me today. As soon as you're released, it makes you so much stronger. I mean, a tiger kept in a cage is gonna be a lot more hungry than a free tiger. I'm proud that he's my boy. I'm proud to be his dad. I made a conscious decision that I was gonna become somebody completely different while sitting in a cell at the age of 17. And I carry that with me throughout my whole sentence. And I carry that with me today. That I'll never go back to that, that kind of living. And that I will continue to, to reach my full potential. Adversity is our biggest asset. And once you understand that, you have taken your power back.